Well, good evening. Thank you so much for coming. If you wouldn't mind taking your seats, we'll get started here uh, very, very soon. You all know me. My name's Jared Ritchie, and this is our fifth annual Bach Lectures. Um, this afternoon, we contemplated briefly uh, the Royal We, uh, renaming it the Hades Lectures, <laughs> given the heat and the warmth. Just think, you know, we're trying to create more of a what it would have felt like in Leipzig, maybe, had, had you there. So um, this evening, you've got a real treat. Let me give you the flow of the evening. We will have, I'll introduce in a moment, our maestro. We will have the first uh, portion will be his then w with lecture and performance, and then we'll take a break. And um, Shannon Trisler. Uh, has put a wonderful spread, you no doubt saw, which we will build in a little bit of uh, social time. She said to me, she said, Jared, I was, went over the top. She's like, this is too much. I'm like, Bach is too much, right? <laughs> um, so it's very fitting, you know. It's not just a slab with two pieces of cheese and a cracker, right? Um, it's very, she's got a beautiful spread. And then we will have a QA and a um, as well uh, with not just Mr. Hodges, but we will have... Um, Dr. Annual and Mr. Buckley will join us here and we'll uh, go over, if you didn't hear their lectures, we did record them, we did not stream them, some wonderful practical and philosophical um, discussions on the Psalms. So I hope it's been a profit to you. Thank you for coming. It uh, has been a great week. I, I've been, my body is very tired, but my spirits are very, very lifted. I, I honestly can say, and um, I hope you will be as excited um, for this evening. I did not give a program, so I would like to introduce our musicians, and we will see how good the old kidneys work. Um, our featured trumpet uh, soloist is Brian Lassiter out of Ruston, Louisiana. Is that correct? You all know uh, the one and only uh, Mrs. Zach Parker, also known as Samantha Parker. She's our first violin. Um, we've got Charles DeJillian. On second violin, Robin Baggerly, she is the old switch hitter. She can play violin or viola, which means 98% of the time she's playing viola. Because those of you string players out there, she will tell you, you will be more wealthy if you play the viola. Uh, everybody goes for the violin, you know. Um, and then, of course, Amanda Roberts, who you will see all over the place, everywhere but in the balcony on uh, the course of the weekend. She's playing piano, and the only thing I didn't make her do is play percussion. So Amanda Roberts on the harpsichord, Mark McCleary on cello, and then, of course, Natalie Telefero uh, on the double bass. Yes, very much. So, um, I our soloist, our uh, soprano soloist, I will defer that introduction to Mr. Hodges, but I will introduce uh, John Mason Hodges, uh, the man, the myth, and the legend, the maestro, uh, the guy who can make music and architecture and uh, theater sound and uh, come across as accessible and this is why we bring him back. We call him the franchise. He's, the, he's, he's LeBron James, and we just build around that, okay? Minus all maybe the extra stuff. Uh, but he is, comes, if you've not heard of Mr. Hodges' Gap Year program, the Center for Western Studies, I'm happy to say we've sent uh, a handful of our students over the last three or four years up there, and it is very rewarding, and they just made it back from... Uh, their wonderful uh, grand tour of Europe and some of you in this room made that tour with them and you set some Guinness World Records of steps per day. Um, so please talk with him about the Center for Western Studies in uh, Memphis where he lives and uh, without any further ado I give you the, uh, the man Maestro Hodges. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you to say such things. Uh, you know not to believe half of it, though, right? It's just <laughs> exaggeration. Um, I'm really delighted to be back here. This, you know, this is the 10th year that Jared has had this Jubilate Deo program, and I, I think that deserves an applause right there. Way to go, Jared.
he draws students from all over. I think you said 15 states, didn't you? That's amazing. So he's doing a fantastic thing for a lot of students, not only at Ubila Tudeo, but at uh, Redeemer uh, Church here and at, uh, at, at Geneva School, too. They're doing wonderful things here for the next generation and their love of music. Uh, <clears throat> I thought I'd tell you one quick story. We're talking about how hot it is. Um, Bach, at one point, when I was doing some research for him many years ago on him, I, I found that he had written a lot of uh, letters to his pastor, sometimes complaining about things, not being paid enough, you know, things like that. But, but what, at one point, the pastor asked him if he could, in the wintertime, um, reduce the length of his cantatas by... 10 minutes. You know, Bach, we're going to sing a cantata in a minute. I'm going to talk about cantatas, but a cantata is a piece normally for a church service. And every uh, Bach wrote a cantata for every Sunday of the year, plus feast days, for we think five years. That's an amazing number. It's pushing the 300 mark of of uh, cantatas, and that's of course not all he wrote, uh, but he wrote a whole lot of cantatas for the church, and the, the pastor asked him if for his cantatas in the winter time, could he reduce the uh, length of them by 10 minutes, and the reason was, the pastor said, since we don't have heat in the church, we need to make the church service a little shorter for the benefit of the, the congregation. You know, they're sitting in the cold. And Bach was willing to do that. He said, sure, I'll be glad to write them a little shorter in the wintertime. But you need to know how long the services were. The pastor wanted to cut uh, a half an hour from the services, going from three and a half hours to three hours. That's how long the services were. And he, every, every Sunday, would give a sermon that was one hour long. I mean, think of that, you pastors. And they were all written out. So he read his sermons for an hour. That was one of the three hours. And Bach was willing to do this, and he said, if you would allow us to take the chorus, because it was men and boys, you know, that sang in the choir there in Leipzig. If I, can, if I can move them out of the church during the sermon into the side uh, uh, building, you know, the school building, where there is heat, so that at least during that hour they can warm up a little bit and they'll come back and sing the rest of the service. And the pastor agreed to that on one condition, that he, they take a copy of his sermon and read it in the other room. So that was, the, that was the exchange. But imagine going from three and a half hours to three hours because people were getting cold. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, what we're going to do tonight is give you a real treat. This is, this is the Bach cantata number 51. Oh, I meant to tell you, um, I told you that he wrote uh, five years' worth of cantatas, but sadly, a lot of them have been lost. He wrote so much music and, 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 pl and played it once, and then it was never played again. It just got lost. In fact, after, uh, after he died, his wife once, his widow, once went to the fish market to buy some fish for dinner, and when she brought it back, to, and unwrapped it, she saw that the, the fish was wrapped in music paper. And it turned out to be part of one of Bach's pieces. It was something he had handwritten. So, there's so there were so many pages of music that he wrote in his lifetime that they were using them to wrap fish in at, at the end of his, uh, her life. Because, you know, when he, when he died, he was sort of out of favor as a... In, in style. He was, you think of Bach as, the, as, the, as a dinosaur. He's kind of the last of the Baroque composers. 
And by the time he died, many of his children were composing too. Maybe you know that he had several very famous children. He had um, 22 children by two uh, wives. I think his first wife had five and his second wife had 17 children. So I can't imagine how he had time to write music, but never mind, that's, that's another, another problem. But, but many of them actually turned out to be com- you know, very good composers in their own right. You've heard of Johann Christian Bach and Johann uh, Wilhelm uh, Friedemann Bach uh, and Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach. These are all children of J.S., Johann Sebastian. And so that's why you always have to put J.S. before his name whenever you write it, because there are a lot of other Bachs. His parents were, were composers, or were musicians, and his grandparents too. So he came from a long line. Anyway, the point is, he was sort of at the end of, a, of an era, and his own children were writing in the new Rococo style before he died. And he encouraged that. He thought that was fine, but he didn't do that. So what you find is that the end of the period, if you're a musicologist, they call the Baroque period ends in 1750. And that seems like a strange year because there were a lot of 1720s and 30s and 40s composers who were writing in this new Rococo style. But it's 1750 because that's the year Bach died. That, he was the end of an era, you see. So we know he wrote all these these cantatas for church, but many of them were lost. Now we have around 200 of them, but we figure there's probably pushing 300 of them in, in existence somewhere, or maybe no longer in existence, but that he wrote at one point or another. Well, this piece is an interesting piece, and it's one of the most, I think, the most challenging to sing and play because uh, he's written a really virtuoso uh, part for the so- soprano soloist and for the trumpet soloist. You have two virtuosos tonight that you'll hear. And the string parts are not easy either, actually. So you'll hear a lot of really fine playing going on up here, very complicated stuff. This cantata is in five movements. It was written for the uh, 15th Sunday of Trinity. You know, the Trinity season in the church calendar goes for quite a number of Sundays. Well, this was the 15th Sunday of, of, uh, of, uh, of Trinity. And it's written for uh, soprano and, t- and trumpet, like I say, and for uh, orchestra. And it's in five movements. The first movement is um, the setting of the text, Jauxet Gott in all in London, which means in German, Jauxet is kind of a shout for joy kind of word. And so it means be joyful or uh, praise God in all lands, in all the lands, over throughout the earth, in other words. So it's all about praising God. We're going to talk about how he does that in the music in just a minute. The second movement is a recitativo, they call it in Italian, a recitative, where, uh, where the text is all about um, praising God quietly, for he has done great things and r- reminds us of our our how our imperfect praises are pleasing to God anyway. Even if we have stammering tongues or we have uh, uh, imperfect uh, verbiage, uh, the fact that we have sincere hearts pleases God. And then there's a lovely pastoral aria. First is an aria that's very vigorous. The second is, in third movement, is a pastoral aria that prays uh, to God to make his goodness known throughout the land. And to, and to come, come new every morning. And then, and then he talks about um, having a, a, a thankful, the thankful spirit of, our, of the people of God uh, that shows to the world that we are his children. The fourth movement is a chorale that he turns into what they call a fantasia, which is a, a kind of a... Uh, um, free form, sort of free form work, where he takes the various lines of, the, of the, the hymn that's being sung and separates them by orchestral playing. So you hear some wonderful orchestral bits between the two violins, uh, especially, and the uh, soprano sings the, the various lines of the, of the chorale, the hymn itself. 
And then that, that fourth movement goes directly into a fifth movement without stopping. And that fifth movement in the, is the text Alleluia, over and over and over and over again. Now you might wonder why it is that um, composers might write uh, melismas. You, all know, you know what a melisma is? A melisma is the kind, is a, is a, a, a note, sorry, a, 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 a syllable rather, being sung on multiple notes. So you might sing, ha 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 right? So it's a whole lot of different notes. Now why on earth would he do that? It's like, you know, the tenor aria in, uh, in uh, 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 Handel's Messiah is, every valley, every valley shall be exalted. Do you know that, you know that tune? And he goes, shall be, shall be exalted. <laughs> Why? <laughs> what on earth is he trying? Why doesn't he just say exalted and get over it and on to the next word, right? Because that's, that's, the, that's the Baroque way. There's the, the Baroque uh, period in particular is all about expression expression of the words, finding a way to make the meaning of the word come across in the music, in the, in the melody. In that case, you know what the word exalted means, right? To be lifted up. So it goes, it's being lifted up, the crooked straight, the crooked straight, like that. Well, he's writing in what they call tone painting. And in a minute, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Julia to come up here and, and speak with you, too. I want to introduce her to you, and maybe she can show us a couple in the, in the score. Anyway, that's the piece, and it's got five movements uh, with a whole lot of these melismas, and we're going to talk about those in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> the first and the third arias are in what they call da capo style. Do you know what da capo means? Da capo is Italian for the cap the head. So it means back to the beginning, back to the, back to the head, to the beginning. And what happens is you, it's really uh, uh, an aria in three parts. Goes A, B, and then returns to A again. Goes back to the beginning and sings A again. And so what you'll hear is a tune in a, in a particular key, and then a contrasting section usually changes key to the relative minor, something else like that. And then at the end of that section, it'll go back to the beginning and you'll hear the first part again. Now the wonderful thing is, you get to hear variations on the melody the second time you hear it. So you'll hear our soprano and you'll hear some of the trumpet work too, where they will uh, vary the, uh, you know, put trills in and other little adornments uh, in the melody. In fact, if you know anything about jazz music, Jazz picks up on this kind of thing, this kind of form. In, in classical jazz, you have what they call a head, which is kind of interesting because da capo means head, right? But uh, uh, it's, it's a, uh, a head, a tune to begin with. And then the, each of the instruments in the, in the band gets to ad lib on that harmonic structure, on that, on that melody. Uh, usually you, the trumpet player gets one, sax player, you know, they'll even give a, a solo to the, to the bass player uh, and, and uh, uh, then the, maybe even the drummer will get a little solo and then they'll come back and they'll play the head again, which is like going back to the beginning and playing the tune again and then they finish, you see. So it's, it's a similar style, it's a similar, not style, it's a similar form is what I mean, similar form. Now I told you about how he wrote them for, uh, for the Trinity season, um, and, but and each, of the, each of the Sundays in the year uh, has a different set of readings, as you might know, uh, and so in the Sundays, for the, the, the cantata is a kind of interpretation of or um, <clears throat> uh, uh, um, improvisation or something on the readings for that day. And in this, this particular cantata's readings, the, thir- the 15th Sunday of Trinity, uh, is Galatians 5, 25 to 6, 10, and it talks specifically about living by the Spirit. 
living in the spirit, um, and, and movement three in particular in its cantata talks about our showing that we're called his children by the way we live our lives, by the, way, by, by the faithfulness of our lives. So gratitude and devotion are signs that we're his, you see. And then the other, the, the gospel reading is Matthew 6, 23 to 34, and specifically uh, the verse about don't worry about what you will eat or what you will wear because God will take care of you. He, he provides food for the birds. He provides clothing for the plants, for the, for the flowers, and so on. And if God cares about birds and, and grass, then he cares about you too, you see. And he won't let you down. He knows what you need, and he knows. Well, the, the first movement, in the, the, the B section of the first movement, talks about how it is that God is always present, always there, always helping, always with you, fa ever faithful. And so Bach is, is writing, you see, either he or one of his uh, uh, librettists would write the texts for these works, but they were all based on a response to the, uh, the uh, texts that were read from the scriptures for that day. And the chorale uh, says that he is promised, uh, and we can rely completely on him uh, uh, through faith. And then it, she sings Amen. You hear her as the, as the congregation, in a sense, doing that. And let me just introduce you to my cohort in crime today. This is um, my dear sister in faith and our soprano soloist for the evening, uh, Miss Julia Cumming. Julia, would you come join us? So good to see you. Thanks for singing with us. Have a seat. Now, Julia and I drove down from Memphis just yesterday um, and I asked her in the car if she maybe would come up here and talk with me about the piece because she studied it a lot as well. And I thought, well, maybe there would be some things that we could talk about together that would give some deeper understanding of the music. I mentioned tone painting in particular. Um, can you think of uh, any particular melismas that really are expressive in the piece? I think it begins with an expressive melisma, oh. starting with the word yakset, which she was saying is like rejoice and an exclamation of praise. And right. we're right out of the gate going, and it, it, it takes off. It, 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 you probably have two bars or so of just this first syllable, yes. don't you? Da -da 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 -da. Can, you? Can you sing a little of it, even if it's... Yeah. Da, da, yeah. Da, 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 da. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> really wonderful. Yeah, that's, and that's just the first word. Let me just say something about Renaissance music before this. This is you at the end of the Baroque period, right? Well, in Renaissance music, I think that the, the beauty of the, the form of the music, the beauty of the harmonies and the beauty of the form of the music took precedence in the minds of the composers. They were willing to set, they were interested in setting texts, right? They set the mass, they set a lot of other texts. But the, the form of the music was the most important thing. And in some cases, like in the music of Palestrina or Bird or some people like that, you can actually take a different text and put it to the same music and it'll still work because the music itself is so wonderful and clear and, and, and clean and so on. Well, in the Baroque period, the Baroque period is the beginning of the opera. The begin in 1600, 167 or so, you have the first opera. And um, opera is a, is a very expressive, emotional storyline, right? People dying and all sorts of things, right? I think about, um, uh, think about uh, 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 Dido and Aeneas, you know, in Purcell's opera, where Dido is lamenting the loss of Aeneas. And she has this deeply personal and deeply expressive aria that she sings, uh, when I'm laid to rest, you know, remember me, remember me. Well, there's no way you can have four or six part harmony in a chorus singing those kind of expressive things with the sort of expression that the Baroque composers really wanted. What they, so they had to clear out all the other parts and just have one person singing in order to be able to do what she just did. 
Imagine a whole uh, a chorus, a whole choir singing that together. Well, it wouldn't work at all, right? But one person can do it expressively, and that's when I think things change. For, for the Baroque composers, they thought first about the meaning of the text, and then they shaped the music to make the text expressive, you see? So, how would you say, rejoice in God all the land? Well, Bach said, let's, let's sing rejoice and hold that note sparkling like a fire, set of fireworks going off, you know, in order to get that joy across to the audience. And that's what, that's what she just did. There are other words that I'm thinking about, like, um, yeah, yeah, you remember that one? The word's höchste, which means <laughs> highest. <laughs> höchste, yeah. Yeah. It means highest. Uh, it starts the second aria that you're talking about. Okay, Yeah. Isn't that marvelous? Lovely. This is going to, you're in for a treat. This is going to be great. <laughs> but do you see what he writes for her? He writes this big leap downward, and the word means highest God, most high God. Höchste. And then it goes up again. I'm spoil the most marvelous sound she has. Well, it's all about expressing something of the meaning of the word across, you see. There's another couple of words. What we're going to do is show you slides that have the German and the English translation. And the English translation, you'll forgive me if it's kind of clunky, but, it's, but, the, but the word for word... German words um, are important to know. You've got to know what the specific word is. In German, often, they'll put the verb at the end of the sentence, you know? So it might be a line like, um, I to the store am going. So if I wanted to make a melisma like this on the word going, because that's the action, it would be, I to the store am going, or something. I'm making this up. Forgive me. But, <laughs> but if you turned it around and actually sang it in English, we would say, I'm going to the store, right? So it would end up being, I'm going to the store. Well, that doesn't make sense. You see, that's not the meaning of the, of the thing. So when you look at the, at the, the uh, uh, slides that I put up there, we put up there, um, you, you'll see the German on one side, it, the way she's singing it, and then you'll see the English in the literal word-for-word -word translation, as best I could do it anyway. And uh, then you'll get to see where those melismas fall. There's one that's on, um, on uh, calling, um, uh, 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 heißen. At the end of one of the movements, you'll hear the word heisen, like we've been called, God, according to the calling of God. And the calling of God has this long melisma on it. It's beautiful. Another one is um, uh, uh, lalen, lalen, which means um, uh, to stammer, to, to speak, but to speak not well. Uh, and so it's in the line of um, even, if, even if our... Uh, our praises are badly spoken, you know, our lalin. Uh, God accepts them anyway. And so he has these moments where she sings lalin in ways that are emphasizing that lalin and how it isn't, you know, uh, even and all that. There, there's some, there's some uh, um, uh, she'll slide from one note to the next, da di da di da da di da da, or something like that. And it's all about how this, this uh, uh, stammering goes on from our praises, but then it reassures us that even those are, are, are appreciated by God. Let me ask you this. What is a coloratura soprano? <laughs> You're one, right? <laughs> what, makes, what, <laughs> what makes you different from other sopranos? The color to a soprano is a soprano that sings fast and high. Fast and high, that's right, that's right. And there are other, they call them fox, right? Ranges. Uh, what, what, kind of, what, what other words do we use for sopranos? Uh, you have dramatic, which is what you think of with the horns and the Wagner. Aha, uh -huh, right. Uh, really, really big uh, voices. And then lyric is somewhat in the middle. It's a more full sound, uh, but isn't going to sing super quick. 
And then Coloratura is fast. <laughs> At the top. Um, and then Subret is basically a young soprano. It's a light, it's a light sound that moves quickly, but not in melismas like a coloratura. Right. So the coloratura singing like you're going to hear tonight is found in Bach. It's found in Handel, but it's also found in a lot of um, early 19th century composers uh, that they call the bel canto opera singers, Bellini and Donizetti and Rossini and all those guys, the Italians uh, that, uh, that wrote. Who else would write for that? Uh, am, I right? am I right? You got the big ones. Uh, the big ones, yeah. Anyway, um, so there's a whole sort of range of opera arias, role, roles for coloratura sopranos. Okay, good. Well, that's what I, I thought. I thought it was just that this coloratura sopranos were the ones that were good looking. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'm being silly. Hoy ot hoy, hoy ot hoy. That's a, that's a dramatic soprano. The, uh, 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 the ones with the horns she's talking about are like the, like the Valkyrie in uh, Wagner's. In uh, yeah. yeah, that's right. You, do you have any horns? You don't have any horns. Do you? Yeah, no. Okay. All right. Well, <clears throat> the other thing I want you to listen for is how the trumpet and the soprano uh, are in duets with each other. Occasionally, there are two different ways it happens. Occasionally, they will sing in thirds with each other. They'll play and sing in thirds with each other. That's kind of fun at the same time. And at other times, you'll hear them imitate each other. There, so there's an imitation, two kinds of polyphony. One is harmonic polyphony like that. The other is imitative polyphony. So she'll sing one figure, and then he'll play it, and then she'll sing it, and then he'll play it. And you'll get a little sort of conversation going on between the two. So listen for that uh, as well. In fact, um, at, well, maybe I'll just let you listen to it. How about that? I was going to get maybe the violins to play something. Would you guys mind find, playing? Could you, would you mind playing the beginning of the chorale? Just the first 10 bars or so? Just so that they can hear how the two parts go together? Just the two of you. I'm putting them on the spot. I'm sorry. I shouldn't do this to them. But they play it so well, I wanted to show them off. Can you try it? That's good, that's good. Isn't that marvelous? <laughs> that's Bach. Lovely, you guys, just lovely. So you're in for a real treat. This is going to be a lot of fun. <clears throat> okay, I'm excited now to hear the piece. If there's one spot I'd like to try with you before we play the whole thing. Um, it's the beginning of the fifth movement, the little Alleluia thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a tricky part for, for the soprano. The part is really difficult, so I don't want to go too fast to make her you know, have to... Uh, uh, stumble on how fast it goes. <clears throat> so let's look at the very beginning of the, f of the uh, 2 4 uh, Alleluia. This is bar 118 and 4. And we. Right on it? Right on it, yeah, let's go right on it. Okay, and I'm going to. Very slow. Right? 1 and 2 and. Mm. Oh. Oh, sorry, a little faster? Yes, please. Okay, 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 okay. She, she's, she knows. Okay, very good. Ready? One and two and one. No, it's not, not fast, not fast enough yet. People can't sing any faster than this. This is, all right. This is okay. Let's at tempo then, huh? Ready? One and two and. Ah, uh, that's lovely, lovely, lovely. That's what we're going to be doing, and now I'm excited to play the piece. That's great. All right, from the beginning, everybody. Bach's cantata number 51. <clears throat> cantata number 51. All set? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Let's get an A before you can.
Thank you all. That is just exquisite. Well, that was musical refreshment, and we are um, now privileged to take a little break, to let you visit with our musicians and our players. Um, I want to, one announcement I failed to give you, we will uh, break till about 8.15 uh, and have some refreshments, so we will, that'll give us about 20 minutes of refreshments there. Um, Braden, if you will put on the screen, we have some cool swag this year. All you have to do is make a donation while supplies last. last. I remember there's a Don McLean song that says, uh, for $5, the flower is free. I've always loved that lyric. Um, for a donation, the shirt is free. Uh, and you can, in the back, you'll see a war chest back there, heavily guarded by uh, uh, someone, I don't know. But it, we only have about 35 of these shirts. But we thought, what could we do to commemorate the fun? Um, so uh, take advantage of that. Do visit a little bit. Uh, what, a, what a treat uh, this was. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, John. Thank you, Brian. One more time, give them a round of applause. A, v a very, very, very lovely treat, especially for the price of admission. Don't you forget that. Um, but what a joy. So uh, we will adjourn. It is uh, 7.55 here-ish, and that will give us about 15 minutes. Uh, you can make your way and have some refreshment. Please keep your refreshments there uh, in the foyer. Don't bring them back in here. Um, that will make a little bit too lively of a Q&A time after that at 8.15. So we'll adjourn till 8.15, and then we'll be back in here for uh, questions. I will have a microphone here, and I will... Uh, 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 we will take some questions for both um, Mr. Hodges as well as our other Bach lecture speakers, Dr. Annual and Mr. Buckley. So let's break till 8.15. Thank you.
Okay. And I'll do the same. I think that you were in the group with... Okay, if you can make your way back to the sanctuary, we'll get started here. If you can make your way back to the to the, the pews here, we'll get going. I may have to go music teacher on this thing and do It always works. It's like Jedi Matrix. Get them to do themselves. <laughs> That's fine. All right, if you'll make your way, we'll get started. We've got these guys are great at bat bantering back with questions. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. All right, well, um, John um, didn't get to hear y'all's lectures today. Sadly. But I thought if you, uh, and maybe some of our audience didn't get to hear uh, the talks you gave today, could you quickly, you two, give a 30 seconds or less you know, a summary of you, what you talked about uh, in your talks yesterday and today. You don't have to itemize. Scott, if you would give a little bit of what you talked about. So whenever the media guy who's sitting in the, the, the backup media guy, this chair, uh, when we get it uploaded, you can know what you're going to be listening to. Give us a little. Yeah, yesterday uh, I focused on the Psalms and particularly addressed uh, some of the reasons I think that psalms have fallen out of favor in a lot of evangelical churches, two primary factors, both of which I have a, I have a book that just came out in May on the topic, and I, right. I address these things as well. And uh, the, the two reasons are, number one, I don't think most Christians understand that the, that the psalms were put together in an intentional flow of the 150 psalms into five books. I described it as a five-movement cantata where the editors of the Psalms post-Babylon took pre-existing material, rearranged it into a larger holistic composition. That's one thing. Number two is that we don't understand poetry and metaphor anymore. And so I talked a little bit about the role of metaphor in communicating in concrete form what otherwise would be abstract and difficult to articulate in other ways. And then I'm, I'm trying to show that there's a connection between the two because what metaphors do on a micro level the story of the Psalms does on a macro level in, in communicating and embodying uh, a, a certain amount of truth. And then I kind of walked through the five movements and explained uh, the, the intentional flow, the unfolding of the Davidic covenant, obviously uh, finding its fruition in David's greater son, Jesus the Messiah. Uh, then today I talked about uh, uh, musical meaning, how music embodies theology. And again, talked about the idea of communicating abstract ideas in concrete form, only in this case specifically applying that to the nature of what music is. Uh, and he talked about the fact that what we do with music is essentially what a preacher does. A preacher takes God's special revelation and interprets it and then creatively communicates that in a sermon. An artist takes God's general revelation, interprets God's through, God through it, and then creatively uh, arranges a, a, an artistic composition to communicate something in concrete form about God as well. And so I just talked about the, the way that that happens in music and, and a little practical uh, kind of picking that apart at the end there as well. Oh, great. Uh, Paul, would you, you were, speaking of practical, you were, you were making us and have a That's good right. time. That's right. I goaded a number of you into chanting some <laughs> psalms over the past couple of days. Um, that was a, a good bit of the burden of what I was doing was to... Um, talk about uh, chant um, and the strength of chant, music that is, is not metered, that doesn't go da 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 da, -da um, because it can conform itself to the psalm text as it stands in any um, legitimate translation in any language, for that matter. Um, not to put that against, um, because I always get asked about David Erb's through composed psalms, and I got asked about them again a while ago. So um, as I always say, this is not in, Chant is not in competition with the sort of work that David's doing, which many of you use in your churches and at home. As a, but as another approach to the, to the psalm, I think one of the, the strengths of, of Chant, um, in addition to um, its ability to conform itself to the, 
to the text as it stands in the real translation, because it does uh, a really good job of honoring the Hebrew parallelism, the way that the lines, so to speak, rhyme with each other in their, in their thought. Um, and today, <clears throat> I, I took um, a specific example of where I think the Psalms can help us in the present moment, and that is in their um, robust view of creation. Um, I know a lot of Christians who are pretty pessimistic about the future of the world these days, not least because things have gone their way politically, and uh, I think that's um, not the right stance for someone who believes in uh, the maker of heaven and earth. So I was pointing out today that the Psalms are acutely aware of violence in the world, abuse, pain, suffering, but what is never lost sight of is that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and that I think we're um, at a moment where uh, we, of all people, need to know how to celebrate, um, to feast in the presence of enemies, and uh, not to forget the utter very goodness of God's creation. And I think the Psalms um, can help form us in that, reorient us toward the world in that. So apparently it tied in quite nicely with what Sounds Scott like. said later. Sounds like. Yeah. I, I would ask any of you, you can maybe give John a chance to banter and then y'all as well. Uh, what do you think, um, they didn't know any of these questions. So be thinking of some questions, because if I don't stump them, you get to. Um, and if you want, we'll open that up. But what do you think, as you see it in your spheres of work, what is something you see the church needs to be looking for when it comes to beauty, say, in music or, or art or psalmody? What do you think is the next thing we need to be tackling? What blind spot do you happen to see in your work in the last five, 10 years that you think we need to be correcting or at least making a more vigorous attempt uh, to improve? Do you have anything that stands out musically, psalmody, hymnody, um, music of Bach, other high art? Uh, well, I, I'm thrilled about your talk. I'm going to have to listen to it now uh, because I think it's easy for us to, to lose sight of that metaphorical understanding. It, it seems to me everything that God reveals, he has to reveal to us metaphorically. And because of our limitations, you know, we aren't infinite like he is. He has to put things in concrete form for us to understand them. But the spirit of our age that infects the church, sadly, wants immediacy. We want things to happen, and not just, not just quickly. Immediate literally means without mediation, without anything between me and it, you see. And metaphors are the way that God can is the thing he puts between us in order to get that invisible reality a, 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 a available to us, not only in, uh, in uh, uh, the Psalms, certainly, uh, in parables, you know, he speaks about the vine and the branches, I'm the vine, you're the branches, he has to speak in terms of metaphors like that. But that's what we do with music, too, and with art, and I think if, the, if that appreciation for the metaphysical, metaphorical rather, I mean metaphorical, uh, dries up in the church, then it's, it, we lose track of this ability to see the things that God wants us to see uh, because we can't see them immediately. We, I mean, even Jesus himself is the mediator, isn't he? He's the one between us and the Father. Uh, and so everything that God gives us is mediated through something. And that's what the arts open our eyes to, so we can see, uh, understand the parables, we can understand the, the scripture, uh, but we can also understand general revelation that way. You know, the heavens are telling the glory of God, so we can see him through the creation as well. And then I think by extension, we can see him through, uh, you know, baptized art, art that's done for his glory. Yeah, I agree completely. I talked about the fact that metaphor, that word, comes from a Greek term that means to carry a cross. And it's that idea you're talking about of mediation. There, yeah. There's, there's yeah. a meaning in the one thing that you're supposed to carry off to the other, but that actually takes work on the part of the, of the listener, of the worshiper. And I think that ties in directly to Psalm 1, where it says, the blessed man 
delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. I think that's what meditation is. That word in Hebrew really has the connotation of to muse on something. Mm -hmm. That's right. The title of my book is to muse on God's music, musing on God's music. Well, well what, is, what is that? Well, well, we muse on God's music when God's word takes on the form of music, poetry, imagery. Uh, but that takes that, that conscious meditation to carry across the meaning of the concrete form to the abstract idea, whether it be just an idea or God himself who is spirit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we need to have that sort of mediation. I agree completely. And, and the, the related thing, to answer your question directly, I really believe when it comes to art or worship, both have the same problem today for, for Christians, for people in general, and, and it ties into your, your, your diagnosis of immediacy. And that is, we tend to see both art and worship as merely expressive, and they certainly are that. We don't recognize that they are also formative. They are forming uh, us. Ah, yeah, that's a good point. So they're both, but we tend to, we tend, whether it's art, it, you know, to use, um, you know, it's the idea of, of the, the utilitarian use of art, where we're just, we're just using it to express what's authentically in our hearts. We tend to view worship that way, too. We come and we just want to be able to, ex you know, authentically express ourselves. Rather than seeing both art and worship and art in worship as that which forms our hearts, forms our expressions to be in conformity with the Word of God and, and pleasing to the Lord. And so I think we need to recover this formative purpose of both art and worship in the church today. Paul, would you add anything to that? Well, I was going to make that point about the formative power of liturgy, and Scott has done uh, better than I would have, so I'll say amen to that. But since I was here talking about the Psalms, and if, if the question is about beauty, um, I'm very grateful that there are churches um, that are picking up chanted psalmody again. Um, and, you know, part of my shtick is to go to churches hither and yon under the auspices of the Theophilus Institute in um, Birmingham and to do weekend psalm seminars. Um, the, the one thing that I, I've become convinced is the challenge on this, and I worry a little bit about it. Uh, the music is not difficult. You know, so if you look at the session the past couple of days, we didn't do any music that was terribly difficult. What does prove difficult for many of us is um, to read the words well and not robotically and to take a jackhammer to every single syllable as if they all have the same sort of weight when they don't. Uh, none of us talks that way, but suddenly when you put the pitch to it and start chanting, it, it comes out. Um, and in e each, place, each place that I have gone for Theopolis to do the chant seminars, um, someone has said to me, including here, um, you know, I think, I think we all believe that the Psalms are the word of God and that we should sing them, we're on board with this, but we're sort of wondering what the end game is. I mean, is this as beautiful as it can be done? Could, could it be done more beautifully? Um, so I, I just worry that churches um, in our circles that are returning to this um, think that the job is done once everyone goes, um, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, therefore, no, the, the work's only beginning, you know, when we, when we do it that way. There needs to be sensitivity to the text. I say something in general about our treatment. Um, okay, there's not a comment on, I, I haven't listened to anyone here read scripture. But I think evangelicals in general in worship do not read scripture well. Um, never mind what you think about the British monarchy. But um, any of you watch the, um, the coronation of Charles at Westminster Abbey a while back? The person who did the epistle reading was the prime minister. Um, Colossians 1, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. That prime minister is Hindu, but you should go listen to how he reads the word of God. He reads it so carefully You'd swear he believes every word, but he reads it as if he wants his listeners 
to actually hear it and not just right through it. So I think we need to work on, on the beauty of even how, I'm not talking about dramatizing our scripture readings, I'm just talking about pacing them well and not acting as if familiarity has bred contempt. Um, often, often um, I hear preachers read the text of scripture faster than they deliver their own words. That's a telltale thing. It's like rush through this and then get to the real meat, which, which is the sermon. So I commend, go listen to a Hindu read Colossians. Um, that's more how it should be. But that, that's part of the problem of been trained in rhetoric very well, many of us, not in how to, how to speak. And then that shows up in our robotic approach to the psalm. So I'm, I just fear if, it, if we do not tether our attention to the contours of the text, this program will ultimately fail because someone's going to wake up one day and say, the emperor has no clothes, there's no beauty to this, doesn't sound like English. So that's, that's my concern there. Um, just switching gears, if you have questions, you know, feel free to step up boldly into that line and I'll you have the microphone, your 15 seconds of fame. But before we do that, I, I was hoping you would talk about um, compositions of music, each of you. Here we are at the Bach Lectures. We have, we named this the Bach Lectures because, uh, as I see it, correct me if I'm wrong, John or Scott or Paul, um, Bach seems to be someone who was well-rooted both musically, as you brought out, generationally in music. But I've often said it seems like he's a great-grandchild of the Reformation, and I think a lot of people misdiagnose that, or they don't give that enough weight in their assessment of his music. Um, some people, Jim Jordan and others, would say, we don't want Bach's music, full cantatas maybe in our services today. Uh, as it uh, as it is, but what whether or not you agree with that statement or not, Bo it seems like Bach's music um, is so steeped in what has come before. You know, you mentioned the cantatas of five books of the Psalms being uh, like a cantata, and a cantata is pre-existing material uh, that's repurposed into something artistically new. Um, you comment about um, about that what, what what you have seen in Bach's works and and how the how the church might do well again to to draw from Bach's music and um, whether or not you think his music should be full cantatas in worship services obviously no one here is asking for that next week uh, but what what is it there any any observations that you've had that that's really kind of where I've been thinking but. I'd love to hear your input on that. Anybody is fair game. You don't have to go in order alphabetical by arrangement yeah, here. So. Go first? Yeah, I mean, he clearly was theologically astute. He had to be uh, theologically uh, uh, interviewed to get his position uh, in the church there in Leipzig. Uh, we have his, his study Bible with notes written in the margins that clearly uh, shows his, his knowledge of other portions of Scripture, even to the point where he would correct something that was, you know, copied wrongly. So he knew his Bible, but you, you, you see, but he wasn't a preacher, right? We don't have sermons from, from Bach, uh, except in the form of music, right? He is preaching through his music, and right. that just shows you the, the way in which, as my talk this afternoon was, was addressing, music itself embodies theology. Uh, if it's music with lyrics, the music is commenting on the lyrics, as you even pointed out tonight. It's, it's painting a picture. It's, it's help, and this is the power of music. It is meditation, Psalm 1, is slow formation. If you just rattle through the reading of Scripture, there's no slow formation taking place. Music, well composed, forces meditation because it forces you to slow down. And the composer is presenting his interpretation of the biblical text or the, or the poem, whatever it is. But even music without lyrics is still, nevertheless, commenting on or interpreting the world, life, or, or the context in which the, the composition is performed. And, and Bach, because he was a committed, pious Christian, knew that and intentionally did that, 
there are composers who are not believers or are not intentionally doing it, and sometimes they, they, they actually stumble on it because they're still created in the image of God or they're working within a tradition that has that embodied, you know, someone like Mozart or, or Beethoven. But, but Bach, not only is he working in a tradition, he is intentionally doing this. Right. And if you study what he's doing in his music, like we talked about tonight, you see him preaching through that music. He is the fifth evangelist, right? He is, he is teaching and preaching through the way that he sets biblical texts. And we, we need to do that today, right? We, we need that. Anybody else? Well, I, th I think we, we have come in our culture to the point where we think that music is for my personal pleasure, kind of, you know, like a subjective, we've talked, Scott and I have had lots of conversations with others about this idea, and I think we both kind of agree about it, that, that a subject, purely subjective approach to music actually spoils the, the, the meaning that you're talking about, you know? The, we, we have to have a sense of how to listen to this, how, how, to, how to read this music, it's like a language. And if you know the language, then you, you, you hear Bach talking to you then through. Why, why is he writing this melisma on this word? What's this, what's this downward slope on this word? Oh, I see. That's, that's the lament or the whatever. You know, there are a million different things that he does. And by the way, he's not the only one who does these things. And there are lots of other ways to do it. Music has a very wide uh, vocabulary. But Bach... Bach was thinking very clearly, like you say, about what it is that he wanted to express. You know, he, he was a Lutheran through and through, theologically. He was a Lutheran, it's true. But he also he was very sympathetic with the pietists of, of his day. The pietists were the ones that were very emotional about their, you know, feeling the, the, the faith and the experiencing the spirit and so on like that. The Lutherans were a lot more kind of calm and cool, you know. But, so he was very much formal like the Lutherans, but his heart had a lot of that pietism in it. And he wanted to get that across to people, you know. Uh, and, and so if you, if you learn something about his music, then you can listen to it not in the, in the mode, is this entertaining to me? Does that sound pretty? That's not the point, <laughs> that, you see. The point is, what is he saying with it? And when you scratch there, you find all sorts of stuff. Uh, to, um, to, to, and it makes you think... Can I tell a little story? Real, Go you for got it. A second? Yeah. I was music director at a big church in Memphis many years, and a buddy of mine is a fantastic cellist, and I lined him up to play a couple of the Bach unaccompanied cello uh, suites. Uh, they are absolutely wonderful. If you've never heard them before, drop everything and go and listen to He wrote six of them, and he, I think this guy played two of them, and they were just exquisite. But I knew that this was a Sunday afternoon concert, and I knew that as soon as that was over, I needed to go to a rehearsal with the Sunday night sort of praise bandy kind of bunch, you know. I didn't have much to do with them, but I was the music director and I wanted to be involved as much as I could with all the services, and so I went to work with them. And I, I have to admit, I thought, after listening to this stellar music, it's going to be horrible to go and listen to, you know, shine, Jesus, shine, or something. <laughs> and I'm sorry, to, I hope I haven't hurt anybody's feelings. That's not my point. Maybe in 1999 you would have heard yeah, something. Yeah, maybe so, okay. <laughs> or 2000. But here's the strange thing. After having listened to all this exquisite music, I found good in those old songs, too. When I got in there, I wasn't just being, you know, looking down my nose at them. Suddenly, I could see the beauty in those, too. And I wanted to bring the, whatever beauty I could find out of that, you know, uh, too. So it, it does form you. It forms your um, soul. Uh, and, it, and it gives you a, a vision for uh, expressiveness, expressiveness uh, in ways other than language. Yeah. And I think that's priceless. So one of the things we, we kind of have worked against is this purely subjectified version, like, do I like the music? It's, it seems contradictory to me to say from the pulpit, uh, uh, come and die. <laughs> you know, that's, that's our message, basically. Um, <laughs> Take up your cross, 
daily and follow me and die to yourself and live in him. That's what we say. And then almost in the next breath in a lot of churches we say, and by the way, what kind of music do you like the best? And I think that's a contradiction in, you yeah. see what I mean? Don't die in that area. <laughs> Don't die in those preferences, you know. Well, you get cherry pick exactly what you want. That's right. That's right. In that particular area, we're yeah. not going to die to ourselves. Ourselves are, what's the word, um, inviolate. You know, yeah. we're there. that's where we say, this is who I am. I like this or that or the other thing. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the wrong spirit. Uh, we, and we'll never be able to understand the language of music and what can be done with it uh, until we get past that, hmm. that sort of... And it's, it's the world's way, right? It's just the way we, everybody is. Right. Uh, shifting gears real quick. Scott, you mentioned yesterday, I might open up a little bit of controversy here. This would be fun. Not with you, but um, in our circles, when we recover a lot of psalm singing, I find that there seems to be a ditch uh, that we wander... You either wander into the ditch of let's chant the psalms, um, or maybe you could even lump David Erb's metrical, I mean, his through composed work in, into that just for the sake of, of making a point. And then peop, where you've had uh, through composed psalmody, uh, I mean, metrical psalmody that we've had through the church, um, hymnifying of psalms, that people want to pick one or the other. And you and your talk yesterday kind of did, which do you like better? And you're kind of like, yeah, I do. You know, <laughs> give it to me, all of it. Um, going to what you said about, you know, uh, the revelation and artistically crafting, uh, I, I would love it if you would say, and Paul, you follow up um, on what do you think, uh, what would be your encouragement to folks to not get in either ditch, um, to both, both be thankful for the metrical psalmody, um, or how to use it, or what would yeah. you say to that? Yeah, so uh, first and foremost, Scripture is our authority, Scripture is our standard, and Scripture is aesthetic. So they're, they're, that has to be our foundation. That's why I love chanting the Psalms as they are in whatever English translation we have. We're just letting the Scripture speak, but even there, whatever psalm tone is chosen is also a, an added sort of interpretation, intensification of that, right? So that has to be our standard. And what I argue is what Scripture does aesthetically then needs to inform anything else that we're going to do, whether that be a metrical psalm, which is close to the psalm, but it's still a, you know, a commentary in the psalm, or even a hymn that hopefully is reflecting on a biblical truth, maybe reflecting on or paraphrasing a particular passage. But I think those two areas are also to be allowed and encouraged because you know, one, I, I quoted uh, uh, or at least alluded to Dorothy Sayers in my talk today when, when she pointed out that it is in the act of creating that we most image our creator God. Mm -hmm. I think God wants us to also create new things, not to the neglect of reading and preaching and meditating and, and singing scripture. We, we have to do that first. If I'm going to choose one or the other, it's going to be that. But I don't think it has to be one or the other because God has created us to be, to be creators. Mm -hmm. And so when we who are, and I don't speak for myself because I'm not a composer, but when those who are gifted with the gift of poetry, uh, the gift of, of musical composition, when they create a new meditation upon the truth of Scripture, that, that is also glorifying to God and ought to be celebrated. So we, we, we need it all. I believe. Well, that's well said. Now you got a back cleanup, Paul. Another point. You got a back cleanup. You know, you have to <laughs> carry on no, the top. No, I'm going to yeah. go straight into the ditch. Uh, <laughs> I'm, well, <laughs> so I do find um, that when I go out to the office and do the psalm chant workshops, inevitably questions come up about metrical psalms. And I'm always very gentle and say nice things about metrical psalms. But my fingers are crossed behind my back just a little bit. And maybe it's time I confess. Because <laughs> the further I get along in life, um, sort of the less patience I have, actually, with a lot of metrical psalms. Because there aren't many metrical psalms that don't have me thinking at some point, oh, come on, what does it really say? What, is it, what does the text really say? And I don't think that's what, you know, we want people thinking in worship is getting distracted by 
convoluted phrases and bloated phrases and so forth. Now, we're back, back away from the ditch a little bit. I mean, I, I, so I, I do music in a church right now and I did in Florida for 13 years and um, both places do, uh, have done metrical songs. Not a, not a whole lot, but um, I mean, some I you know, inherited once I got into the position and some I, I actually introduced. Um, my only worry is that, it's not my only worry, but, but one, one big worry is that metrical psalms have a tendency to push out the real thing um, in some places. And the, the very existence made my ministry in Florida um, sort of difficult as I'm trying to introduce chant. Because there's the Trinity Psalter sitting in the pews. People are saying, why can't we just sing this to Amazing Grace? You know, or America the Beautiful, or whatever it might be, these known tunes that are in there. Um, so I, I, um, I don't want to have to choose, you know, between either. But I, I do think for... I'm sorry, I've said some nice things about orthodoxy and, and Anglicans in the last couple of days and so forth. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of call us to a reformed humility again here and say something else. Um, that this preoccupation with rewriting the word of God so that it will rhyme and, and suit us really is a, is a reformed thing. You know, um, there's a orthodox deacon in Los Angeles who directs the music at his parish. And when the LA Times wrote to a bunch of churches and said, would you send us a copy of your hymnal? The Orthodox Deacon said, sure, and sent them a copy of the Psalter. Um, but it was like the real thing. Okay, it's a translation of Septuagint, which is the Greek translation. Okay, okay but I mean, it's not, it's not a metrical, metrical paraphrase. And I mentioned yesterday um, someone who had calculated that um, at St. Paul's Cathedral in London, since its founding in something like AD 604, that each one of the psalms has been sung more than 17,500 times. Um, and we're talking about rewriting things, uh, you know, so that people will like singing them better. And, you know, there's some traditions that are just sort of getting on with it and, and singing them as they stand. So I, I just, I, I don't want to say, you know, I'm not, say, I'm not going to say that it's evil to do a paraphrase of a psalm um, but, you know, the, the real thing, I think, needs to, to take precedence for a while. You know, if you, if you did that, you could write some really, really good things. Yeah, right. Well, isn't that really the beauty of Bach, his writing, was that he was so steeped in Scripture? I often think that we're not going to get a recovery of, of mature music without a maturity of faith and the word and knowing that and that seems to be like the way that comes is letting it dwell in you I mean you, you can't just decide you're going to be mature you need God's word to mature you right so you know I didn't have a chance to answer that previous question about what, what we, can we take from Bach moving forward which is just as fine but just as well because I don't have anything particularly profound to say um, so I'm, but I'll make this observation though Bach uh, doesn't just spring out of nowhere it took the church more than a millennium, a millennium and a half to produce it. That's right. And I think, um, it's not my favorite composer right, to, to sit and listen to, which is probably a confession of sin here. But <laughs> I think I can objectively say his, you know, his equal has not been found since then. And it's something we can take some pride in, that you know, the greatest composer in, in, in the history of the world is an evangelical Christian believer. Um, but he doesn't come from out of nowhere. He, he clearly knows who his pre he knows his predecessors, mm. including Gregorian chant, right, and all the way up. And you know, I'm no composer, but I would just say to aspiring composers, um, you need to know as much of the of the tradition um, as you can. Um, Byzantine chant, Gregorian chant, and everything else up to the present. Amen. Yeah, Amen. I hear a lot of times people say. 
are you against new music as a church musician, all of us here? I say, I'm not against new music. I'm against new music that has no conscious awareness that there's been music come before it. So I think music that has not been written, that's been written as if it exists in a vacuum, which box music did not, as you stated. So. Well, no one stood up there to the, oh, someone uh -huh. stood up there. All right, Will Merritt, you? Yeah, so Jared, you've written You can somewhere. pick that up and raise it up to sky level. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere you've written um, in one of your Substack pieces, I believe, that the truth of art is higher, and it's said, been said by philosophers and others, than the truth of fact. And that makes me think also of the piece that you had in there, and Dr. Annual had talked about um, the fittingness, how, be how beauty is a fittingness. And in the context of these conversations around truth and art and expression and what do you do with that philosophical, you know, uh, saying that art, the truth of art, is higher than the truth of fact? Yeah, well, I would just say tr truth is more than fact. It is no less than fact, but it is more than fact because words alone are inadequate to capture the, the fullness of what truth is. Uh, that's why we need, that's why. God needs, not that he needs it, but it's why he chose to communicate through metaphor. Uh, it's why Jesus chose to communicate through parable. It's not, it's not that they're just sanctioning it. Hey, this is a nice thing to do. They, they, in order to actually communicate the fullness of truth, it required an artistic communication. Amen. Because art embodies the fullness of truth. Now, we, we need propositions, right? So truth is no less than propositional, but it is more than propositional. I think that's the, that's the talk about ditches, that's the other ditch, right? That's the ditch of a lot of mainline churches where they are, there's beauty and there's no truth because there's no propositional truth, right? We need both. Truth is, is propositional, but it is more than propositional. So we evangelicals with you know, with, with, with modernism impacting us, define truth as merely propositional. The sort of liberal Christians define truth as merely aesthetic. And the pre-modern Christians and theologians, Bach included, would have said it's both. You need both. Why? Because that's what Scripture is. Scripture is not a systematic theology. It's not just a collection of definitions. It's an artistic medium communicating truth in all of its fullness. Anybody else want to add to that? No, that's well said. Right. Next question. Maestro, I wanted to, I had a very basic question. So if we were to track, say, the hand motions of Sam on first violin, they'd probably be the same every time, or very close. When you as a conductor are conducting, do you think your hand motions and each time you've conducted this would have been exactly the same, or do you vary them? <laughs> do you think about it? Mm -mm. I'm afraid I don't much anymore. <laughs> I, I don't. The idea, the, I had a conducting teacher tell me one time that you have to, uh, you have to be so uh, aware, unaware of your body that it happens almost instinctively. The, the way he put it to me one time was, he was a little German man, and he said, think about the millipede. The millipede? Yes, the millipede. If he were to think as he's walking along, now I'm going to lift leg 293, you know. He would fall all over himself, right? The idea is to, you, you learn technique, from the violin, the piano, conducting, all of that. You learn the technique, but then, then you, it's, it's supposed to be fluid then from what you're imagining, what you're hoping for. So... I, I, might, I might do a different gesture for a particular entrance or a, you know, a gesture like this for an entrance or whatever, and it's all hopefully intuitive that's expressing the music now. It's, it's just, that, that's the idea, to get sort of out of the way of it, thinking rationally, you know. I'm not saying it's irrational, don't get me wrong. It's very, it's like hyper-rational. It's like you're saying about the truth is more than just propositions. The, the performance is more than just a series of, you know, it's the reason AI will never really take over the world. It's because people aren't, AI is not human. It's not human. Yeah. Interesting question. Yeah, that was, that was an interesting question. Well, time is, 
is escaping us. So would you please, uh, oh, we have one more question. We are Trinitarian, so we'll allow it. All right, John, take it away. Thank you, by the way. Oh, yeah, thanks. So how old was Bach when he died? 65. So would the Baroque era have continued if he had lived longer? Uh, yeah, if he continued to live and continued to write at the pace that he was writing. Holy mackerel, he was churning it out, man. So yeah, I, I, would, I think so, sure. Yeah, it was also retroactively applied, right? I mean, it wasn't like the next right, year someone right. said, and the Baroque era is ended. Right. You know? Yeah, and it may be also important to, to emphasize that not many people actually knew a lot of his music at that point. Right. It, was, died, it was really right. recovered 100 years later. That's right. And that's when it really came to the fore. So That's very true. Yeah, it's the, the dating of a period is, is retroactive. Yeah, very good. And he was kind of known in his life as an organist. You know, <laughs> he wasn't known for his compositions. He was known as an organist, and he was an amazing organist, I guess. But later on, you know, all of his incredible compositions came to light, and and ever since Mendelssohn, basically, uh, it hasn't been uh, dimmed again. I think everybody would say, whether they're Christians or not, every musician would say he's the king. He's the one who's done the greatest work admiring them. And whether they're Western or not, I mean, even around yes, the world, right, right. he is recognized and performed as the master that he ja is. Japanese box societies are cropping up all over the place. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. That's great. Well, I, uh, I'm so thankful to the three of you for entertaining my request to come and speak. And really, this is all for me. They can just sit in the same room. <laughs> so I'm very thankful. Would you join me in thanking these three gentlemen? So if, if you wouldn't mind, if you'll stand, we'll close and we will be adjourned till next year. So let's stand and we'll pray. Our Father, we do thank you for this evening and thank you for this great discussion and performance that we were able to hear tonight. Thank you for the gift of song and the ability to understand you in greater ways through it and to understand your created order. We ask that you would bless our evening, a safe travel as we return to our homes and uh, continue to watch over us through the remainder of this week. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, good night. <laughs>